The small principality of Monaco, in spite of its independence, is an integral part of the French Riviera, the Azure Coast. It has no border station, own currency, or language. Its territory is only one and a half square kilometers. Its population is approximately 30,000, but of this, only about 40,000 are natives. Many people obtain citizenship, buy a flat, and form a company here, as the small state is a tax haven. The wealth and luxury that characterize this country are partly due to this. The new global aristocracy, the millionaire playboys, ship magnates, rich sportsmen, and world stars have always liked to visit here as much as exiled rulers and now impoverished old-style aristocrats. Besides the favorable financial investment possibilities, there are other attractions like the legendary casino and the colorful programs, from the Formula One race to the circus festival, and especially Monaco's atmosphere and elegance. These attract here the more than two million tourists every year, because who would not like to spend a holiday and look around at such a place where any time you can accidentally meet either a pop music idol or a Hollywood star? Monaco's length is hardly more than three and a half kilometers, and its width varies between 150 and 100 meters. The country lies on two promontories running into the sea. On one lies the 800 meter long Monaco, and on the other, the considerably smaller Monte Carlo. The harbor of Locandamina has been built between these two. The upper city, situated on the hillside to the east, is called Bosolil, and the other, to the west, is called Monaghetti. The modern town parts of Fontvial are Niza, and the Monte Carlo beach is spreading over to Menton. Long ago, La Turbe, Is, Roccabrun, and even Menton have been part of the principality. The La Tête de Chien mountain, meaning dog's head, towers over the small country. The casino that made Monaco world famous was opened in the middle of the 1800s. Princess Caroline, the wife of Florestan I, helped its birth. The woman was fond of the game of chances, often was guest in the casino in Germany. Her own experiences gave her the idea that the really huge money is gained by the casino owners themselves. Besides, the operated gambling house gives additional profits through the hotels and the catering places, even the turnover of the shops can increase. The French and the Italian Riviera started to become popular at that time. Rich British lords traveled from the foggy Albion to the bright sunshine to find refreshment. Writers and poets settled down in the coastal towns, mainly during the winter months and in early spring. This time, the stagecoaches already regularly transported passengers here, who often spent weeks or even months in the bright sunshine on the beach of the Blue Sea. The sea bathing, which earlier wasn't a popular habit, started to become general among the well-to-do men wrote a travel book which introduced Europe's many states. Prince Florestan soon died, but beforehand he gave his blessings to his wife's plans, which his son, Charles III, also supported, especially as Monaco needed money and they could not introduce a new tax to the anyway turbulent citizens. Because of the infrequent stagecoach and ship service, no crowds attended the casino. However, it could be seen that by a larger investment, the gambling could become a prospering business, and by that the small country's financial situation can improve. First, the casino was opened in the buildings facing the palace gate. Today, the gendarmerie's barracks are there. Charles III called here from Bad Homburg, the brilliant Francois Blanc, the magus of casinos. This was the first time when Monaco really prospered this time-bound post and custom union with France and issued the first stamps. The new casino was built on the cliff of Spelugier, and from that time on it was called Monte Carlo to honor the prince. The Formula One car race became a really big attraction of Monaco. During its more than 75-year past, there were supporters and opponents, but surely, without this race heat, the speed circus wouldn't be as popular as it is. During the timekeeping trainings and the heats, the audience are crowded in the windows and on the balconies. Those rooms of the hotels from which the race can be followed are booked even a year ahead. 
many people let their balconies and windows for thousands of dollars for these days. In the Formula One, this is the only path which hasn't been constructed for the race purposes, sterilized and closed from the world. Here, a living, pulsating town is formed for the race purposes. But during the everydays, we ourselves can also drive along the way where the famous pilots do. Maybe this fact and the dangerous nature of the path make the Monaco race so popular among the fans. The path is full with hairpin bends and tunnels. Some parts are steeply rising, sometimes very tight, and the dangerous tracing gives hard tasks to the racers. The path is 3.2 kilometers long, and the pilots have to run 100 circles. Many, mainly those who have suffered accident or had to give up the race, made the statement that Monaco's streets are not suitable for such a race. However, the scientific and well-practiced pilots and the crowds of fans enjoy the special circumstances. The Principality has important financial and prestige interests to hold as many huge events as possible. It's not accidental that more and more sports events, football, boxing and tennis games, and motorboat world championships are organized, as these keep the interest and secure good media for the small country, which main income is from the tourism. On the world pomp dressed square of the Place du Casino, next to the casino stands Monaco's first luxury hotel, the Hotel de Paris, work of the famous French architect Dutroux. Several world famous people stayed here, like Winston Churchill, who spent the most time here before he bought his own villa in Menton. The terrace on the other side of the square also belongs to this hotel. From the casino, we can walk along the coast path to the harbour of Locandamine. There are luxury shops, bazaars along the way. Here stands the theatre named after Grace Princess. Its architectural solutions well represent natural features of the room-limited Monte Carlo. The terraced building fades into the cliff which vertically falls into the sea. Its terraces are beautifully gardened lookout points and are connected by elevators. Rainier III named the lower part of the avenue about John F. Kennedy, whom he appreciated a lot. The road reaches the harbor closely to the Saint Devote Chapel. The casino building also includes a theater and has been planned in 1862 by Garnier, the brilliant architect of the French Big Opera. This time was founded a joint stock company which is operating the casino, the public baths and hotels, and long later the stock company's main shareholder became the Greek shipping magnate Onassis. Blanc urged the construction of a coastal train between Nice Menton and a new road between Nice Monaco. The costs were soon refunded. Monaco had its real golden age at this time. Everyone important among the suddenly becoming rich capitalists visited here. Bankers, actors, painters and aristocrats, businessmen and royals, manufacturers and poets hurried to try their fortune in gambling. Dumas and Metalink, Mauriac and Beaumarchais, Berlioz and Caruso, Chalyapin and Maria Callas all visited here. All famous composers and singers of the 19th and 20th centuries have visited the Opera House of Monte Carlo. Many of them rent or own a flat in one of the splendid palaces. Monaco originally meant the old town built on the long promontory where the prince's palace is in the center. One of the world's most significant sea museums is the Oceanography Museum of Monaco. It's a huge building with several floors, standing since 1910 on the top of the cliff of the old town. It's been constructed for 11 years, and it's mainly leaning on pillars standing in the sea. It was established by Prince Albert I, who tried to find himself a kind of duty after his first unsuccessful marriage. 
He worked together with Professor Milna Edwards, the most famous representative of the newly formed branch of science. They were examining the sea currents and also executed deep sea researches. The prince went on his first independent research in 1855 on his ship called Hirondel. Soon he remarried and obtained a new ship named after his wife. With the Princess Alice, he could collect samples from 6,000 meters deep. During his expeditions, he planned to re-establish the museum to exhibit the research results. The aquarium on the ground floor of the building has 80 containers giving home for several thousand fishes and sea creatures. Here can be seen the unique deep-sea fish specimen Grimaldictus profundissimus, which the prince discovered at a depth of 6,035 meters and named after his family. The exhibited creatures are kept and fed in a natural medium. The greatest experience is given by the thousand glistening, colorful tropical sea fishes, ranging from the smallest to the biggest. Fishes of one color and brightly colored, striped and spotted, adapting themselves to the sea bottom, and fishes who change their colors, octopuses, crabs, turtles, sea plants and plant-shaped animals, it's almost impossible to list the varieties. We can find dangerous predatory fishes, ones which hurt humans if only touching them, ones which inject poison into their victims, and ones which gently form groups at the glass walls and curiously watch the visitors. So reads the brochure of the museum. There's also scientific work ongoing at the aquarium. The researchers investigate the habits, reproduction, and lifestyle of the fishes. The creatures can be divided into two big groups according to their places, the tropical coral reefs and the creatures of the Mediterranean Sea. On the screen of the micro-aquarium, even the visitors can see the planktons and other microscopic sea creatures. The museum occupies the two upper floors of the building. The film shown here was made during the expeditions financed by the museum. The Hirondelles Laboratory and the models of Prince Albert's four research ships are exhibited. The Hirondelle 1 was a 200-ton sailing ship. The other three ships, the Princess Alice, the Princess Alice II, and the Hirondelle II, were liners which grew progressively more huge and modern. The other significant part of the exhibition was given by Captain Jacques-Yves Cousteau, who managed the museum during the 80s. His exhibitions are immortalized in documentary films, TV series, and books, and the objects of his researches are placed here. Naturally, we can see the model of the Calypso, his famous ship, and the tools they used on it, and in the big room, his films are continuously on show. His 115-hour life's work ensures that the regular visitors of the museum can always watch something new. The only hobby of the young sailor Jacques Cousteau was film shooting. Cousteau had brilliant technical affinity, he started to deal with the idea of underwater film shooting around 1940. In order to be able to make longer films, he invented the compressed air divers set, which he carried out in 1942 together with the engineer Emile Gagnon. The divers still use breathing sets of such a construction. Close to the end of the war, with his camera and equipments, he helped the Navy to find the mines in French waters.
After the war, his research team did deep diving down to 90 metres. The JB-26 Minesweeper was built in 1942 in Seattle, Washington. An entrepreneur bought it four years after the war and used it as a ferry boat between Malta and the island of Gozo. He named it Calypso after the nymph who seduced Odysseus. With the help of a generous patron, Cousteau managed to buy the overfatigued ferry boat, which has spent a year and had been totally reshaped in a shipbuilding garage in Antibes. A new stand has been assembled above the commanding bridge. On a stem, a downturning platform has been constructed to help the divers get into the water. To the prow of the ship, directly under the water line, a steel glass watching cabin has been mounted. Naturally, also comfortable sleeping cabins and a laboratory have also been formed on the deck of the former minesweeper. Later, adjusting to the experiences of the expeditions, the Calypso was renewed from time to time. In 1972, for instance, a helicopter was moved onto its deck. Despite more and more modern techniques in telecommunication and satellite means, the ship several times came to serious danger. Cyclones attacked them at the Philippine Islands. A huge ice covered the ship on the Antarctic that even its stability became risky. They ran aground at the Galapagos Islands, hit a sandbank on the Mississippi, and during the war between Israel and Egypt, they almost got torpedoed on the Suez Canal. However, the Calypso and its crew faced all dangers. They did their undertaken work, searched the seven seas, and reported in films and books all that they have found. Cousteau's name became world famous in 1953 because of his book entitled The World of Silence, of which five million copies have been sold. The film, based on the book, won the main prize of the Cannes Film Festival in 1956. In addition, it was also awarded Emmy and Oscar prizes. That was the first time when the audience could see color films of divers moving naturally underwater, using their own developed fast electric vehicles, finding wreckages, meeting and making friends with sea creatures. One of the stars of the film was a saw perch who, like a curious and faithful dog, joined the group during the film shooting. The divers christened it Ulysses. The Calypso, on its first voyage, played part in an underwater oil search in the Persian Gulf. Later, near to Marseille, it helped the excavation of a 2,000-year-old Greek galley. 
During three years, the group made 10,000 immersions with breathing apparatus and brought to the surface 8,000 amphora and 12,000 other ancient earthen vessels. These became the properties of a museum in Marseille. For the deep sea excavation, they improved an underwater TV system and a vacuum pump for the sediment releasing of the findings. In 1956, the Calypso got new equipment. The two-person deep-sea research ship is also the captain's invention. The diving saucer can carry its passengers down to 4,000 meters deep and make shootings and collect samples. Getting enthusiastic about the submarine's successes, they tried to research the possibilities of staying underwater longer. The crew of the research team spent one month on the underwater living base, established first 20, later 50 meters deep. The film Sunless World, introducing this habitat, brought the third Oscar prize to Captain Cousteau. The next experiment was about a base in 100 meters depth. In the early 60s, Cousteau was awarded several honors, and President Kennedy awarded him the Golden Medal for Exploration. His popularity rivaled that of film stars. In February 1967 in Monte Carlo, the Calypso was newly painted and equipped, waiting for its longest voyage so far. Its crew was preparing for a three-year-long journey. Princess Rainier and Grace Kelly also participated in the farewell event. They even brought a present, Zoom the Bloodhound. Afterwards, the legendary journey began, and millions could see the great discoveries and the great adventure lasted for decades. The films Odyssey and Rivers of the Huge Earth followed, and later the 46th part Rediscovering the World. During his long life, Cousteau made 70 films and was the writer or co-writer of 60 books. Among others, together with Frédéric Dumas, he wrote The World of Silence, with Philippe Diolet, our Water Friends, and Treasure Hunting in the Deep Sea. Also, many wrote about him. He's the hero of the adventure novel titled The Secret of the Greek Galley and Secrets of Calypso. After his death, animation series were made about him in France. He took over as director of the Oceanography Museum of Monaco in 1957, and he had a rented flat in the downtown. For his 75th birthday, a worldwide celebration was organized for him in Monaco. Many rulers and ministers, as well as world-famous artists, attended. Jack Lemmon was the master of ceremonies. The captain's older son died in a helicopter accident during one of the expeditions. His beloved wife, who has always traveled with him, died in 1990. He was gone in 1997, but the films of his scientific work and his books are preserved in the museum and stay with us. In the big hall of the museum, the means of the deep sea researching, the diving suits, diving bells and submarines are exhibited. We can see heavy diving suits made of copper and wooden life-sustaining apparatus in which the air was pumped by hand. Cousteau's and Albert Falco's diving suits are also exhibited. In the room called Whale Halls, skeletons of ancient animals, dyed or alive sea creatures, are hung out or placed in storage tanks. 
Prince Albert and Captain Cousteau gave the main part of the deep sea findings to the museum and the other exhibited objects having been bought. The films shown here are about the delivery and the setting up of the huge whale skeleton. The skeletons of the already died out animals are especially interesting because without these findings we would never know about their former existence. The St. Martin Park, extending from the Oceanography Museum to the Cathedra, just like the Jardin Exotique, was planted with tropical plants that like this climate. Through the gaps of the thick vegetation, we can overview to the harbour, and if we look up, we can see the Doghead Mountain. Behind the harbour, the tower houses of Fontavielle are standing on the territory reclaimed from the sea. The statue of Prince Albert, standing in the park, was made by François Cognier in 1951. The prince has three statues in the old town, but probably this one is the most expressive. Monaco has rocky ground, and perhaps it's due to the pleasant microclimate that the cactuses, the succulents, the evergreens, and the exotic plants feel right at home in the carefully tended parks. The Cathedral of Monaco was set up at the end of the 19th century on the former place of a 13th century church. The building, named after the Immaculate Conception, was planned by French architect Charles Lenormand from snow-white cones in neo-Romanesque style. Already Prince Charles II requested that Monaco be declared as an independent bishopric. As at that time even the independence of the small state was in question, the decision did not happen. So the French and the Italian church influence wrestled each other through the decades, until in 1887 the Pope decided about the independent bishopric. Probably the cathedral built in the meantime also helped the decision. Under the marble flooring of the church rest the members of the royal family, Charles after whom Monte Carlo was named, the scientist Albert, the tragic Grace Kelly, and since 2005 also Rainier III. On their tombs, the flowers are everlasting. In the interior of the church, several relics and works of art are placed. These originate from other former church buildings, just like the white marble decoration of the main altar and the organ. The work, titled Fra Angelico of Provence, originates from the 15th century, just like the 18-part altar picture showing Saint Nicholas. The Spanish Renaissance altar and Louis Breas Pieta in the Holiness Chapel are extremely valuable. The romantic Arch Renaissance building next to the cathedral is the location of the country's highest court. From the park next to the cathedral, we can have an overview to the harbour. Four anchoring places have been created to help the shipping traffic that considerably increased during the 20th century. Lochandamine's huge harbour is called Port Hercule. To the west, we can find the Cap d'Ail and Fontvielle and to the east, Lavato Harbours. Due to the liberal taxation laws, a lot of people register their luxury yachts here and also keep them here during the year. Those who like ships could never find a better place for looking around. All kinds of sailing and motor-driven water vehicles can be found here. 
The name of the Grimaldi family first appeared in the history of the French coast in the 13th century. Otto Canella's ancestors were sailors. He played an important role in the Republic of Genoa. In 1133, he was elected as Council of the City. His son, Grimaldi Canella, inherited this title from him, and he has given the family's new name. Genoa built two fortresses this time on the territory of present Monaco. The foundation stone of the one standing on the place of the prince's palace was laid down on June 10th, 1215. The opinions differ on how the trade family has obtained their riches. Their actions seem to prove the saying that the second million can be earned in an honest way. It's sure that the more and more well-to-do politicians got involved into the inner conflicts between the Empire of Genoa and the Pontificate, and as a result, Rainier I finally had to escape. The family of Italian origin had several relatives living in southern France, so they settled in Provence, but they were preparing themselves for the return and revenge. They reshaped their trade ships into battleships, and actually, they attacked the Genoese trade ships and caravans like pirates. In January 1297, the Franciscan order monks singing psalms have asked for entrance to Monaco's fortress. The unsuspecting garrison opened the gates, and the cunning Francesco Grimaldi occupied the fortress, actually without facing any resistance. Since then, the cowl-wearing monks have been keeping the royal family's red-white blazon. The coming hundred years were punctuated by skirmishing between Genoa and the Grimaldis. The family used force, money and supporters to keep possession, and finally they managed to do it several times. Rainier Grimaldi became Admiral of the French Navy. His son Charles could many times call himself legal proprietor of the small state, but this didn't last long. The famous Genoese Doge, Simon Boccanegra, about whom later Verdi wrote an opera, annexed the territory. Forty years later, French King Louis II's widow and province's viceroy gave the Grimaldis back their rights. Prince Albert I achieved remarkable scientific results, while his descendant Louis II was interested in the military calling. He earned medals as a French colonel and chevalier of the Legion of Honor. Charlotte, the daughter of Louis II, married Pierre de Polignacos. They had two children, Antoinette and her brother Rainier, who from 1949 followed his grandfather on the throne. His ancestors' characteristics were typical for him. He was both a sportsman and a businessman. During his university years, he played boxing and tennis. Alfred Hitchcock, the great crime master in 1955, shot his film To Catch a Thief in Monaco, starring the already Oscar Prize winning actors Grace Kelly and Cary Grant, supposedly partners at that time. The details aren't known, but one year later the luxurious wedding of the fiancé wasn't to the handsome actor, but to Prince Rainier. After this, the beautiful blonde actress retired from acting and undertook only documentaries popularizing Monaco. The ducal couple had three children, Albert, Caroline, and Stephanie. The tragedy happened in 1982 when Princess Grace's car lost traction and sped off a winding road. Grace Kelly died in the hospital due to her injuries. Her daughter Stephanie also suffered serious injuries. The tabloids suspected that the daughter had been driving the car with no driving license or practice. The princess was buried in the Monaco Cathedral near the palace. A relief and a table remind us of the accident along the way to Nice. The ducal couple's children live their lives exposed to the tabloids and photographers. The magazines laid bare the daughter's love affairs. For instance, with different circus men, 
abundantly and in public. Caroline's husband, Stefano Casiraghi, motorboat competitor, died in 1990 in an accident, bringing mourning to the family again. For Prince Rainier, only their two children, Charlotte and André, gave the pleasure of being a grandfather. The Principality can say thank you for the casino to Charles III, for the Oceanography Museum to Albert I, for the Formula One race to Louis II, and for the Circus Festival to Rainier III. Princess Grace is commemorated by the theatre that bears her name. The Prince has not remarried and could not forget his great love during all his life. He died at an advanced age in 2005, in the same week as Pope John Paul II. Perhaps the strength, the fighting spirit, good coordinating and business skills of the Grimaldi family have also died with him. What kind of ruler could his weak-handed playboy son Albert be? Is it possible that the destiny of the small state is in the grandchildren's hands? The possibility of abolition of the principality and proclaiming a republic have never come up as in other European monarchies, and as long as the casino and tourism ensure good living, it probably will not happen. All the roads lead to the square in front of the palace, where there is a changing of the guard each day at noon. The 16 bronze cameras have been donated to the small country by the Sun King. We can have a nice view to the harbor from the side of the cannonballs that are placed in a pyramid-shaped group. Even beyond Menton, we can see Italy. After several transformations, the palace took its current shape in the time of Louis II. The decorative stairs, the inner yard, and the main entrance have also been constructed in that time. Some bastions and part of the walls have been removed, and gardens occupied their places on the southern part. The last great reconstruction was around 1880, and since then only the suites have been modernized. Rainier III lived here until his death together with his son. His daughters, however, prefer living in their modern coastal villas. At the corner of the Place du Palais stands a work of Constant Roux, the allegoric statue of science excavating the ocean secrets. A bus takes the visitors up to the old town. Those arriving by car can park in the parking place hollowed inside the cliff. There's a cinema room where films show us the history of the Principality. The Vielle Villa makes a good conquest not by its sights or grandiose dimension, but its intimate mood. It's worth roaming on the narrow streets surrounded by souvenir shops, where we can find either nice Renaissance gate, painted facade, or antique wall well. In addition to the palace and the cathedral, we can visit the historical museum of Monaco, which is actually a waxworks with the wax copies of the rulers and their family members, and the bodyguard barracks that are of Genoese style. Most of the buildings in the old town were planned by the local Francois Bozio. His memorial tablet is on the house where he was born. Honorius II was the first who officially got the title Prince of Monaco, a huge income also associated to his several titles. Perhaps he gave the most part 
to the family's richness. He strengthened the poor quality castle and founded the Grimaldi art collection with pictures of great masters like Michelangelo, Tiziano, Raffaello, and Rubens. The descendants further strengthened the connection with France. Later, the French Revolution and the Vienna Agreement endangered the independence of the small state. In the 1848 Austrian Italian War, Italy won with French help, but the victory had great price. Two lands of Monaco, Roque Brunet and Menton, were attached to France. However, Monaco got 4 million francs compensation. After this, the foundation of the casino and the prosperity of Monaco came. The businessman Charles III was followed on the throne by the scientist Albert and the soldier Louis II. All the rest are already in the history of our present days. The La Condamine part of the city is located in an amphitheater-like valley between the mountains of Tête de Chien and Mount Agel. Long ago, ploughlands, fruit gardens and olive tree parks overlaid here. Its first building is Villa Bellevue, stood lonely close to the coast and is still standing there. The improvement started after the building of the casino and today more and more tower buildings are constructed. As everywhere where the prices of buildings are high, the expanding is going way up. Already the ancient Greeks galleys anchored in the harbour which got its today shape at the end of the 19th century. La Condamine is a modern port with shops and offices, but also several sites are here. For instance, the famous Jardin Exotique, the botanical garden with tropical plants, the zoo, anthropological museum, and the Iranian Arts Museum, which has been formed in Reza Khan's former villa. At the corner of the harbour, under a viaduct overhanging a tight valley, stands the Saint Devote Chapel. It was named after a Corsican Christian woman who lived in the third century and whom the heathens killed because of her religion. The legend says that they wanted to deliver her body to Africa, but the ship got into a storm. The pigeon guided the boat to Monaco Harbour, where a chapel has been built to honour the saint. Someone wanted to rob the coffin in the 11th century, but the saint performed a miracle. The ship was burned in the harbour. Since then, at the end of each January, the people celebrate by a procession and burning a worthless boat. There's a stone forming a race car in the roundabout in front of the chapel. This is in the memory of the first winner of the Formula One race, William Grovern, who founded the Williams Box. The race was founded in 1929 by Prince Louis Rainier II, who dedicated the statue, also as a salutation to his grandfather's memory. Among the many car racers, there was Bernie Eccleston as well. Rainier himself was a good friend of driving. However, he didn't play this sport for race. He kept a range of beautiful car miracles in the garage of his palace. His father, Pierre de Polignac, started to collect the cars. The statue of Belgian Prince Albert is also a sample to show that rulers and aristocrats who have been exiled or grew poor gladly came and settled in the principality. Above Monaco in the mountains, there are winding roads called cornices, providing a brilliant view. From their parking places, all the small country can be seen. We can have a nice excursion to three mountain villages, which were also part of Monaco. Is has a province-style mountain village and reserves its medieval face. Roquebrun has the oldest still standing, intact, strengthened castle of France. The site of La Tourbie is a monument from the Roman age, near to the observatory. 
the Roman army crossing the Alps followed the road of today's Grand Corniche de Gaulle. A grandiose monument, the Tower of Augustus was built in memory of this event. It's 50 meters high, 38 meters wide, and a semicircular colonnade is standing on its base. Here stood the statues of the military leaders, while that of the emperor on the top of a circle-shaped tower. Only the memory tables and the reliefs remained. The statues did not. The drawings showing the reconstruction can be seen in the nearby museum. The market in La Tourbie gives a real southern French feeling. Lovely vegetables, bright violet aubergines, zucchinis, snow white asparaguses, and deep green artichokes. Fresh and dried spices, the smell fills the whole market hall. Tempting color fruits, peaches, and melons. At the butchers, nicely chopped prepared goods await the gourmet French and Monaco people. Together with the meats, the suitable wine is offered. The atmosphere of the cafes is unmistakable. We are far from the noise of the coast, high almost among the clouds. Here, nobody is in a hurry. The coffee, a delicious French sandwich with panache, are such things that cannot be done in a hurry. The baker offers a French countryman's bread and long baguette, and of course a croissant, which is nowhere else in the world so light as here. In the nearby Menton and in the mountain villages, the perfumes and soaps are prepared in traditional ways, even today, by using lemon. The spices are sold in small spice mills that are made from olive trees, and the virgin olive oil in charming small bottles. The products made by using lemon, the olive, and lavender are the real specialities of Provence, Monaco, and the Côte d'Azur. Even the tablecloths and curtains have olive and lavender decorations, and the tile pots have a lemon shape. The small restaurants are tempting with Mediterranean specialities. Pizza is rather popular here as well, but the French are fond of the soups, the onion, fish, or tomato soups. After that can come, for instance, a chicken in a sauce made of local white wine, or a rosemary lamb steak. When the weather is very hot, the grilled fish or crabs are popular with a fresh baguette and a colorful salad. The light lunch is ready. After that, a glass of local wine gives pleasure, but only if we keep the limit, because we have to drive down along a steep road full of hairpin bends and with several marvelous sights. To the east, the mellowed old Menton, beyond that, the Italian Riviera, to the west, the high-life Nice, the festival town, Cannes, and the fashionable Saint-Tropez.